Hi everyone, I'm Elaine Quijano. Congress is gearing up for two high stakes showdowns this week. On Wednesday, former special counsel Robert Mueller will testify on Capitol Hill. He's expected in back to back appearances before the House Judiciary and Intelligence Committees. Here's what President Trump said today when asked if he'll be tuning in. No, I'm not going to be watching. Probably, maybe I'll see a little bit of it. I'm not going to be wa watching Mueller uh, because uh, you can't take all those bites out of the apple. We had uh, no collusion, no obstruction. We had no nothing. We had uh, a total no collusion finding. The Democrats were devastated by it. They went crazy. They've gone off the deep end. They're not doing anything. That's not the only event the Trump administration is bracing for. The White House is also trying to cut a budget deal with Congress this week. The tentative plan would raise government spending over the next two years and boost the federal borrowing limit. But negotiations are coming down to the wire. We are four days away from the House adjourning for its August recess. The president was focused on Congress today, just not for these reasons. He instead renewed attacks on the four progressive Congresswomen he's been publicly feuding with for over a week. Catherine Johnson reports from Capitol Hill. President Trump is staying on the offensive against four Democratic Congresswomen known as the Squad. This morning, he tweeted, the squad is a very racist group of troublemakers who are young, inexperienced, and not very smart. So bad for our country. They're pulling the Democrats way left. Nobody knows how to handle them. I feel they're easy to handle. To me, they're easy to handle because they're just out there. They're very bad for our country, absolutely. The president's tweet last week telling the women of color to go back from where they came has sparked conversations about race in America. No, no, no Mr. racial President, tension. Even your no, no, there's no racial tension. Look, I had my best numbers recently, and it's because of the economy and what I've done for the African-American. A new CBS News poll finds an overwhelming majority of Americans see the country as divided along racial lines. Nearly 9 in 10 Americans, 87% of poll respondents, say the country is divided along racial lines. A really dangerous ideology that's about othering people, dehumanizing others. And we have to continue to fight back. When asked specifically about the president's go back tweet, 48% said they describe it as racist. 34% said it was not racist. Katherine Johnson, CBS News, Capitol Hill. Ryan Grimm joins me now. He is the Washington Bureau Chief of The Intercept and author of the new book, We've Got People. And with me here on set in New York is Jamel Bowie. He's a CBS News political analyst and a New York Times opinion columnist. His most recent piece is called The Joy of Hatred. Welcome to you both. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'd like to start with you, Ryan. The president is focusing his attention on his feud with these four progressive congresswomen. A recent CBS News YouGov poll found 59% of Americans disagree with Mr. Trump's comments, while about 40% agree. 88% of Democrats disagree with the remarks, while 82% of Republicans agree. Is it clear, Ryan, how sustainable this strategy will be until the election? Well, he's probably going to want to ramp it up uh, as he gets further into the election. You know, race baiting is Donald Trump's comfort zone. And so, you know, wh wh whenever and whenever he's out of the news for a sustained period of time, he starts to feel uncomfortable. And the Democrats were engaged in their own intra-party feud between House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the squad. And so wh what Trump sees is a national conversation that's happening that doesn't involve him. So he, uh, you know, he managed to involve himself by kind of upping the attack on on those four members of Congress. But think about it. Here we are. We're, it's the summer of 2019. Trump likes to up the ante over and over and over again. So for, for him to continue to fire off tweets that take off like a rocket, which is what he said, you know, he missed and what he was excited about with, with this tweet, means that he's going to have to keep laying it on thicker and thicker. And we still have more than a year to go until the presidential election. So uh, I don't think this will be sustained. I think it'll just be increased. Um, and it doesn't bother him necessarily that, that it doesn't poll very well over the general public. What he's trying to do is, is goose turnout 
uh, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan among uh, white working class people that, that didn't turn out in 2018, but did turn out for him in 2016. So, Jamel, we mentioned your most recent column called The Joy of Hatred earlier. It centered on the president's rally last week where supporters chanted, send her back, directed at Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. You write this, quote, a political rally centered on the denunciation of a prominent black person demands reference to our history of communal celebratory racism. It's critical for placing the event in context, and it can help us understand the dynamic between the president and his base. So walk us through, Jamel, this dynamic that you've highlighted here. So what we have in uh, American history frequently is events where people sort of gather together to celebrate kind of racial hatred, to celebrate racial disdain, and that, uh, I think you see that dynamic at work with the rallies the president is holding. Um, it's really, I think, striking to me that President Trump didn't actually lead the group in a uh, send her back chant. Mm -hmm. It was, it, it emerged spontaneously from the people at the rally. And I think they kind of understood the back and forth and the energy between them and the president. They wanted to affirm what the president was saying. And then in turn, the president kind of just bashed in the chant for some time. And while he would later say that he disapproved of it and he wanted to admonish them, it's very clear from the video that President Trump enjoyed what was happening. And I think that that phenomenon, which has happened, we've seen before in American history, uh, most dramatically in sort of the age of communal lynchings, but not just that, is the, is the dynamic of sort of the crowd and the president and his supporters seeing each other in each other, the crowd seeing the president express their frustrations and their anger and even their hatreds and the president in turn drawing from that and then putting it back into the world. I just want to raise because some people watching might say, look, you know, it's right. one thing when you talk about lynching, which is a physical act here. Right. It's another when you're talking about rhetoric that could be perceived as racist. What do you say to that? I would say that it's, well, I say in the column, the president's rally wasn't a lynch mob and that's, I, I want to be absolutely clear about that. But I think we have to be able to see how these dynamics and how these energies and feelings um, have historical antecedents. They have a context, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. This doesn't just emerge into the ether. Mm -hmm. Into the ether uh, from a vacuum, right? From a vacuum. And so the context for events in American history, and I think it, it's hard. You know, it's hard to argue that telling a group of non-white congresswomen to go back to where they came from, including, it should be said, Ayanna Presley, who is just an American-born African-American, right? Sort of her her ancestry, like mine, for example, goes back to, uh, to the days of slavery. Mm -hmm. So there's no place for her to go back to more so than any other group. That has to be read in racial terms. Maybe you don't want to call it racist, maybe mm -hmm. that seems too harsh, but there's no getting around the racial animus behind it. And so when you have a group of people chanting and cheering about that, and then doing so in the context of Representative Omar, who herself is an immigrant and a black woman, that it's it's too reminiscent of the past to ignore. Mm -hmm. There are echoes of the past in right. what we heard. Uh, let's bring into this conversation our chief congressional correspondent, Nancy Cordes. Uh, Nancy, thanks for joining us. So defenders of the president have repeatedly said that his comments have nothing to do with race. However, we saw uh, in response to prominent African-American Republicans speak out against the president's remarks. Let's first listen to what Congressman Will Hurd told you, Nancy, earlier. I think this is a behavior unbecoming of a president, but also it hurts us politically because there was a civil war going on within the Democratic Party, and now everybody's kind of circled the wagons and are, are, have, have come to their defense. We should be debating their positions on getting rid of private insurance. We should be debating their positions to continue the Iran deal. We should be de debating their positions on supporting socialism, not where they're from or where they're not from. We should point out those comments were from last week for people who, who may remember. Then, Nancy, of course, Senator Tim Scott called the president's comments, quote, racially offensive in a statement last week. They are the only two African-American Republicans in Congress. How concerned are Republicans, um, first of all, uh, addressing what Congressman Hurd said there, that this feuding could hurt them politically, but also behind the scenes, Nancy, is there a conversation taking place among Republicans about the long-term implications of this kind of rhetoric? 
Yes, there is a concern, uh, not only because uh, they don't think that that kind of rhetoric should represent the Re Republican Party, but also because of what they think it could do to their current and uh, future potential voting base. Uh, look, the president is, is not going to get a large percentage of the African-American vote in 2020, no matter what. However, um, you know, for Republicans who are running down ballot, uh, they do have to be concerned that if he turns off African-American voters, if he turns off, more importantly for their voting base, uh, Hispanic voters, um, that could mean the difference between them being reelected or not being reelected in states like Texas or New Mexico or California or Florida or what have you. Um, it won't make a big difference for the president necessarily in Wisconsin or Michigan, uh, but it will in it, for them in other states. And that's why his language troubles them. Uh, it also could potentially hurt them with women. We know from uh, a great deal of past polling that this kind of language turns women off. Um, and so that's why Republican leaders have really gone into overdrive to try to argue uh, this isn't about race. It is about ideology. We just don't agree with what these women stand for. The president doesn't agree with what they stand for. But the problem is that the president himself keeps dragging it back into that racially tinged arena. And so, uh, you know, as hard as Republican leaders try to kind of tra change the rhetoric and move in another direction, unless they really come out full force uh, like uh, like Hurd or or Tim Scott or, or some of these other Republican ha Republicans have unless you really have Republican leaders uh, saying in unison to the president you need to change your language and look we don't know if, if he would change it even then but it could have an impact on getting him to tone down this type of language uh, going forward but so far they've been unwilling to do that. So Vice President Mike Pence sat down with CBS News Chief Washington correspondent Major Garrett over the weekend, and he was asked about how patriotism is playing into this debate. Let's listen to some of that. You'd be patriotic and oppose the president's reelection. Of course. But what these members of Congress have been doing, Those, referring to our country as garbage. That's unpatriotic. Is, it's unacceptable. It's unpatriotic. And President Trump is going to continue to stand up for America and call out that kind of rhetoric by those members, and it's time that Democrat and leadership in Congress did the same. But even as they say that, they can stay? <laughs> of course they can stay. Okay. They're American citizens. So, Ryan, can you just explain for us what appears to be this very fine line that Republicans, including the vice president, are walking here in criticizing these four congresswomen? Well, in order to walk a fine line, they're, they're completely blurring it to begin with. You know, the, the garbage comment they're talking about is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez calling the health care system garbage and saying that she wants to improve upon the health care system. I think probably uh, an extraordinary number of people who have any interaction with our health care system would readily acknowledge that it is complete garbage and it needs to be improved on. What they're trying to say is to twist that, to say that what she's actually saying is that America itself is garbage. The irony, of course, being that Donald Trump's entire inaugural speech was about American carnage. Uh, it was this nightmarish litany of problems with, with the United States uh, that, that he described himself as, as utter carnage. You know, the, if you use Pence's logic, that would have been an extremely unpatriotic inaugural address. But, of course, there's nothing wrong with saying that a country has problems. You, you can't improve it unless you point out what, what the problems are. So none of this is on the level. None of this is serious or, or in good faith. Uh, it's all twisted in the wind in, in the wake of, uh, of Trump's comments. Let's turn to another topic. Nancy, Robert Mueller will appear before the House Intelligence and Judiciary Committees Wednesday. What are the big questions Democrats are looking to have answered by the former special counsel? Well, interestingly, you know, they're, they're not going to try to get him necessarily to break a ton of new ground. They realize that that might be a, a futile effort. Uh, Robert Mueller is a uh, reluctant witness, and he's made it clear that he's interested in saying less rather than more. So Democrats, uh, as they prepare, are planning to work with that. Um, have him answer simple questions, things like, did you find evidence that the president tried to obstruct justice? Did 
did you find evidence that the president tried to interfere with your investigation? Because what they're trying to do at the end of the day is paint a picture for the American public of a president who is uh, utterly unresponsive to laws and norms, a president who overstepped his bounds, uh, a president who tried to obstruct justice. And they think that if they can just um, get a back and forth with this former special counsel, a, a neutral arbiter, uh, who can say, yes, I found evidence of wrongdoing by the president in these, you know, in a variety of different situations, uh, they think that that will strengthen their case, that at the very least, this president needs to be investigated by multiple congressional committees and potentially down the line even needs to be impeached. Well, in our final minute, Jamel, in a recent opinion piece called Trump voters are not the only voters, you describe a, quote, relentless focus on the president's base. How did that come to be? I think the president's surprise win in 2016 and the fact that we saw this turnout among, among these infrequent non-college white voters kind of shocked the entire political world into really focusing on them as sort of a critical demographic in the election. But I think we've also forgotten that most people who voted in 2016 didn't vote for Trump. In 2018, when that anti-Trump group of voters all turned out to vote for Democrats, there was a win for Democrats. And I think as we look forward to 2020, we have to be sure to not just think about, does this help the president with this base, but how does this affect everyone else as well? Mm -hmm. And will there be pushback, will there be mobilization by these other voters in response to the president's comments, the president's behavior? Big open question. Ryan Grimm, Jamel Bowie, and Nancy Cordes, thanks to you all. I'll really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome.